When we were lambing, uh, we checked the ewes regularly uh, for little people. Here a ewe is a, is a mama sheep. And if a ewe was in labor for more than an hour and things weren't going well, my dad would put clean straw down on part of the barn floor and, and drop a fence panel on the straw. Then he'd go in the house, get his stainless steel pail, fill it with hot water and some sterilizing soap. He'd get a safety razor, a scalpel, a scrub brush, four needles that were threaded with a couple feet of gut thread, put them on the pail, and grab some shaving soap, a hypodermic needle, an ovocaine, and penicillin. Then he'd get my kid's sister to come and help. They'd lie that sheep down on her side and tie her to the panel so she couldn't move at all. Then my dad, what he'd do is measure down from the backbone six inches, and then from the point of the hip, you measure uh, forward six inches. And right at that, uh, right at that point, he just shear about eight inch, ten inch patch right around that point, and then put on latex gloves, shave the area with a safety razor, and then scrub it with sterile soap. When he got all that done, then he'd give two or three shots around to to deaden the pain. Uh, after that, he'd make an incision about four inches long through the outer skin and then down through the next layer of tissue. There's muscle, and then there's another layer of tissue. And then he'd get a hold of the uter uterus. For little people, the uterus is kind of a sac to the lamb or lambs because a lot of the time they're actually twins, but they're inside of that. So he'd get a hold of the uterus and, and cut that open with a, about a four-inch incision. Now, he had to keep a hold of the uterus so it wouldn't slap, slip back in and get everything contaminated and then reach inside and pull out the lamb or the lambs. And then he'd pull them out and hand them to my sister and she'd have to get them, uh, their motor started. They, they, when they're born, they have mucus plugs in their, in their nostrils and, and whatnot. And so she'd have to get that all cleaned up and, 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 and get them fired up. After getting the lamb out of the uterus, uh, Dad would have my sister hand him one of the threaded needles. And then he'd sew the uterine incision shut so it's, it's smooth on the inside because he wanted to lamb the next year. When, it, when it's done, it looks it's a little bumpy on the outside. It looks sort of like when you put the tips of your fingers together is what it looks like from the outside. And then... Uh, He'd sew the outer layers of tissue and muscle just by pulling them together. The outside skin had to be stitched so it was smooth on the inside and bumpy on the outside, too. Then he'd give the, the U a shot of penicillin to prevent infection and put it in one of the lambing pens. We call them jugs, but it's a, it's a pen in the barn. It has a heat lamp and water and feed. And then you make sure the lambs get colostrum. Colostrum is this first milk. It's a different color. It's really high in fat and has a lot of antibodies. And in ruminants, like, uh, like a, a lamb, it's really critical that they get that. It's a little bit different than humans because their digestive system is different, but that's where they get all their immunities right then, and so it's important to get the colostrum. And Dad tells me he never had a U die from this procedure. Well, that's what you call a cesarean or a C-section. That's what it is. The whole procedure is pretty traumatic for any poor sheep that has to undergo it. Since they can't understand what they're going through. They, all they can do is be terrified, and they are. One minute the poor sheep is standing there ailing, just not doing very well at all. The next minute it's being tackled, grabbed, and tied onto a fence uh, panel, then being cut open. Another point to keep in mind is all this pain is being inflicted by someone who actually cares about the sheep. It's a good shepherd someone who's actually deliberately doing all this. And if it hadn't been done, that you hadn't been tied up and cut open, it's a cinch bet that the lamb or lambs would have died and that mama you might have died as well. So the sheep man isn't trying to torment his sheep. He cares enough about them that he's willing to go ahead and tie them to a fence uh, panel, uh, shave, stab them with needles, cut them open, all these things are just instruments used by the sheep man for the benefit of the sheep and to bring forth a new life. A good shepherd wouldn't dream of inflicting pain for the sake of pain because he doesn't want to hurt a sheep. Now, if that's true with respect to just the ordinary sheep man, how much more is it true with respect to our good shepherd? If the ordinary sheep man wouldn't dream of inflicting pain on his sheep unless it were really necessary, how much more true is that of our Lord? Our Lord is the good shepherd, the very best of all possible shepherds. And of course, we know, and we know with the certainty of faith, which is, means we're absolutely certain, that he wants each and every one of us to be saved. 
just as we celebrate on Good Friday and just as he said in today's gospel, he so loves us, he so loves his sheep, that he actually laid down his life for them. And so although it's true that he does allow pain in this life and sometimes an immense amount of pain, we need to see that suffering through the eyes of faith and recognize that even though we might not be able to grasp right then why we're suffering, whatever the particular reasons for this suffering are, this suffering will increase our glory in heaven if only we let it. That is essential to keep in mind. It's not meaningless. Even if we can't see or understand why it is that we're undergoing it, it has a very deep meaning. The saints had a clear understanding of this principle. For example, when speaking of the troubles and sufferings and pains in this life, St. Francis of Assisi said, quote, So great is the good which I expect in the next life that all pain to me is but a delight. So great is the good that I expect in the next life, all pain to me is a delight. He realized clearly, much more clearly than we do, the reward that was associated with suffering virtuously. It's a great reward. Besides, there's no escaping it. In this life, we're going to suffer. But suffering is much easier to bear if we bear in mind that it will increase our glory in heaven, if only we let it. We sure don't have to look for sufferings. They're going to come our way. We're all going to suffer to some degree, especially living, trying to live godly lives in this degenerate and wicked society. How many of us have been harassed for just trying to keep Sunday holy and maybe not go shopping or refuse to look at some image on someone's iPhone or been mocked from modest dress or deportment? Or asked, where did all those children come from? Don't you know how to prevent them? Given a bad time because you're not sterilized and contraceptive or being reviled for homeschooling your children. How many of you have converted from a more worldly way of living and then only to find yourself having to take abuse from your old friends and your family? In this regard, our holy patron, St. Peter, has some encouraging, inspired words. You should consider them, quote, let the time that is past suffice for doing what the Gentiles, he means the pagans, let the time that is past suffice for doing what the Gentiles like to do, living in licentiousness, passions, drunkenness, revels, carousing, and lawless idolatry. They are surprised that you do not now join them in the same wild profligacy, and they abuse you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Close quote. The pagans are surprised that you not now join them in the same wild partying, lust, drunkenness, carousing, and the like, and they abuse you. But they will give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. The Haydock commentary explains this first thing that is as if St. Peter said, You who are Gentiles have already lived too long in vices before your conversion so that they who are not yet converted marvel at the change they see in you, make a jest of you, talk against you, for you're not running on with them the same wicked and shameful disorders. But they shall render an exact account of all that to the just judge of the living and the dead. It's consoling, especially for people that have had major conversions. But all the realization that our suffering will increase our greater glory in heaven if we let it is a great help in bearing the pain. Another very important way to bear our suffering is to come to a deeper understanding of the various reasons our Lord has permitted a particular suffering in our lives. In regards to a deeper understanding of those reasons, I'd like to recommend a really good little book. It was written, published in 1935. It's back in print, but it has an easy uh, title to remember, Why Must I Suffer? The name of the book is Why Must I Suffer? It's by Father F.J. Remler. I have been sentient priest. Why Must I Suffer? First published in 1935. It's back in print. Uh, in this book, the, the author places before the reader 15 different reasons why the Good Shepherd permits suffering. And each one of those 15 reasons is worthy of prayerful consideration. It's something that you could meditate your way through. Today, given the state of our society and because we're limited by time, we'll only consider one of the reasons. Otherwise, we'd be here all day and we developing them but one reason for suffering, and that's for the expiation 
of public and national sins. The expiation of public and national sins. I'll quote. The second reason why you must suffer, especially in times of general calamity, is this. As a member of society and a citizen of your country, you must unite with the rest in making atonement. Now, for little people, atonement means making a reconciliation between God and man. You must unite with the rest in making the atonement reparation which divine justice requires for the public and national sins committed in the community in which you live. It's really important. As a member of society and a citizen of your country, you must unite with the rest and making the atonement and reparation which divine justice requires for the public and national sins committed in the community in which you live. By public and national acts, we understand certain sins of a graver nature, which are committed on so large a scale and by so many persons in a community, be it a city or a province or an entire nation, that they are attributed to the community as a body and not merely to this or that individual. Okay, now he's got a list. I want you to listen carefully as we go through this list of typical public and national sins and ask yourself if any of these can be found committed on a large scale by many persons here in our beloved country. And keep in mind, this is written in 1935. <clears throat> sins of this kind are apostasy from the faith, irreligion and forgetfulness of God, godless education of the young, profanation of God's holy name, cursing, blasphemy, and perjury, the desecration of the Lord's day, immodest and scandalous fashions, immoral art, immoral literature, immoral amusements, divorce and adultery sanctioned by iniquitous state laws, dishonesty, injustice, oppression of the poor, outsourcing jobs to Chinese prisoners, other third world workers, murder and race suicide. This is before the decriminalization of abortion, before doctor prescribed suicide, widespread contraception and sterilization, even among Catholics. And of course, Planned Parenthood deliberately targets blacks and Hispanics, and they target every Catholic if they could figure out how. Finally, those wild orgies of gross immorality and unrestrained license which periodically disgrace public festivities and celebrations or occur in connection with balls, dances, banquets, and the like. Could have even conceived of a modern high school prom or spring break or the rock and roll culture or the modern nightclub scene. I don't think you need me to tell you that each and every one of these sins is committed on a large scale by innumerable numbers of people here in our beloved country. God is exceedingly patient, long-suffering. He does not willingly inflict general chastisements, however richly they may be deserved by a community. He rather desires that his offending children seek his pardon by means of a timely repentance and conversion. He waited a hundred years before he sent the deluge, which he had commissioned Noah to announce. He allowed 40 years to last between the prediction of the destruction of Jerusalem made by our Lord and the fulfillment of that prediction by the Romans in the year 70. He spared the city of Nineveh altogether because its inhabitants immediately left off sinning and hastened to do penance at the preaching of Jonas. Now listen to this carefully. God acts in this way still. He often waits a long time before he inflicts on sinful cities and nations those more extensive chastisements which their multiplied iniquities call for. He desires to spare them and therefore tries first in every possible way to recall them to a sense of their duty and a timely repentance and conversion. But if in spite of these delays, they obstinately refuse to enter into themselves and to leave off sinning. If they continue in their wickedness, sometimes even to the point of sinning even more boldly because their evil deeds are not punished at once, 
Then the hour must come in which the measure of their iniquity is filled to overflowing. That hour will mark the beginning of some general visitation will fall heavily upon the guilty community as a just punishment of its long-continued transgressions of God's holy law. Destructive floods or storms, conflagrations, earthquakes, seasons of scarcity and famine, epidemics and pestilences, and especially the horrors of rebellion and revolution and of civil and international wars. Divine justice makes use of these evils for the punishment and correction of a sinful people much the same way a wise father uses the rod for the chastisement and betterment of a wayward child. Nor is it always necessary that God send such chastisements for public sins as he sent the deluge for the destruction of Jerusalem. There are many sins which contain in themselves the seeds of future public suffering, just as the acorn contains the gigantic oak. If such sins prevail for a sufficiently long time, unchecked and unrepented, they're bound to produce such conditions in the social order as to make certain calamities unavoidable. Take, for example, the sin of godless education, that is, education of youth without religion. Where such a system has been adopted, the necessary results must be the following. He is writing in 1935. He's writing in 1935. Where such a system has been adopted, the necessary results must be the following. After two or three generations, the knowledge of God will disappear more or less completely among the people. The sense of right and wrong will be lost. Good will be called evil and evil good. There will be no respect for the moral law. The depravity of youth will grow worse and worse. Dishonesty and corruption will prevail in business, in the courts, in the legislature, and in the government itself. Taxes will be misappropriated or disappear in the pockets of grafters. Heavy expenses will be necessary to maintain the growing numbers of asylums, juvenile courts, reform schools, and prisons. There will be no security to honor property or life. Violence and bloodshed will become inevitable. Family life will be disrupted by adultery, divorce, and free love. National rivalries, jealousies, and hatreds promoted by commercial greed grow more and more intense until they lead to international wars with their unspeakable misery for millions. Nations that sow the whirlwind must reap the storm. Public and national sins must be expiated in this world for the very simple reason they cannot be expiated in the next. That's an important principle. Nations are judged in this life. They don't have a future life. Cities are judged in this life. They don't have a future life. Public and national sins must be expiated in this world for the very simple reason that they cannot be expiated in the next. In the world to come, families, cities, provinces, and nations will have no continual corporate existence. Their men and women will exist merely as individuals without being united by those social, civil, political, and national bonds which are necessary in this life for the welfare and preservation of the human race. In eternity, they will individually enjoy the fruits of their life on earth. The good will possess the kingdom of God in heaven, while the wicked shall suffer for their evil deeds in the unquenchable fires of hell. But as public sins require public expiation, and as this expiation cannot be made in this next life, it is clear it must be made on this side of the grave. A question which pro proves a sore temptation suggests itself in this connection. Why is it that the good and the virtuous are not exempt at such times, but are compelled to suffer like the rest? If God is just, how can he allow the innocent 
to be afflicted with the guilty. There are several reasons why God permits the good to suffer in times of public chastisement. Number one, it is right and just that the good should lend a willing hand in offering to God the atonement made necessary by public sins. Because in normal times, they enjoy in common with their fellow citizens the blessings of peace, tranquility, and national prosperity. Their temporal interests are common, both in times of prosperity and in times of affliction. Number two, those who are innocent of having actually taken part in public sins are not for that reason always wholly free from guilt in the sight of God. Very often they are guilty of these sins in an indirect manner, accessory to them, as it is called. Thus they may have connived at some form of immorality. They may have not protested against it. They may have neglected to use their authority or influence or right to vote to hinder its introduction or to procure its removal when already introduced. And all this from indifference, human respect, fear of persecution, loss of business, and other similar unworthy reasons. Number three, the sufferings endured by the good have a much greater atoning value than those endured by the wicked. Hence, the more good persons are to join in making the required atonement, the more quickly will it be made. Besides, God is easily moved out of consideration for the sufferings of the good, greatly to mitigate his punishments, and sometimes to cancel them altogether. Number four, the sight of the good suffering for sins which they did not commit is apt to promote the conversion and salvation of the wicked, by vividly reminding them of the more rigorous chastisements inflicted for sin in the next life. If sin is punished so severely upon the good here on earth, how much more severely will it be punished upon unrepentant sinners in eternity? Number five. Such sufferings afford the good the opportunity of making full atonement for their personal sins. For there is no one so holy and so confirmed in grace that he has not committed some sins, such at least as are venial, or accepting, of course, the Blessed Mother. But it is an unchanging law that every sin, even the smallest, must be fully expiated either here or in purgatory. But expiation made here is vastly more profitable than that which is made after death. You merit here by your sufferings. Your glory increases. If you're suffering rightly, if you're suffering in the state of grace, the reward, you get a reward for that suffering in the next life. There's no reward for suffering in purgatory. Purgatory, you're just getting clean. No merit in purgatory. All the merit is in this life. All the merit is in this life. That's essential to realize. All the merit. We are going to pay now or pay later. There's no way of getting out of it. Every single sin has a punishment associated with it. It's pay now or pay later. We want to pay now because we get a reward for suffering now. Number six, finally. The patient enduring of undeserved suffering makes the good resemble Jesus Christ, who, although perfectly innocent, took upon himself the task of making atonements for our sins and thereby opening heaven to us. If he had not made this atonement, we could not be saved. Besides, innocent sufferings enable the good to reach the highest degrees of grace and virtue here, which will produce for them a correspondingly high degree of endless glory in the kingdom of heaven. That's from Why Must I Suffer? A Book of Light and Consolation by Father F.J. Remler. Okay. Well, our beloved country has sown the whirlwind, and we are going to reap the storm. There is no escaping it. Barring direct divine intervention, we are going to suffer. Let us have no illusions about this. And let us not get too worked up about it either. What do you mean, Father? You get the grace that you need for every day at the moment you need it. If we have suffering in the future, we don't have grace for the future. We have the grace for the right now. Just keep saying your prayers and do your duty in your state and life, and you'll get the graces you need as you need them. Stay in the state of grace. 
In regard to suffering, St. Peter has some very consoling words. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal which comes upon you to try you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings. For the time has come for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will do right and entrust their souls to a faithful creator. Close quote. He's the good shepherd. If he's allowing us to suffer, it's for a good reason, even if we don't understand it. Come what may, let's keep in mind that our Lord is the good shepherd. He wants each and every one of us to be saved. So if he permits us to suffer, it will not only decrease or completely eliminate our purgatory time, it will also increase our glory in heaven, if only we let it. Let us pray for a deep, immovable faith in Christ our Lord, a faith so strong that each one of us can say with St. Francis, so great is the reward which I expect in the next life that all pain is to me a delight. And if times get really rough, if we find ourselves getting down or depressed, let's renew our devotion to Our Lady and keep crying out to the Good Shepherd for help. There's wonderful inspired words of St. Peter. These are powerful scriptures to keep close at hand whenever we're suffering and burdened by troubles. St. Peter, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Burn that one into your mind. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. By his wounds you have been healed. For you are as sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name but our heaven given to man whereby we must be saved. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You are sheep gone astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved.